Okay, is uh, I hope this is working now. My name's Greg Stone. Uh, as for the last, uh, I guess, 22 conferences, I will be, I, I'm the uh, chair of the technical program for the uh, IRIS Rotating Machine Conference. This is our 23rd conference and uh, our first virtual conference. As many of you might know, we last year, because of the COVID issues, we canceled the conference. And this year we elected to, uh, because of the uncertainties, to do a uh, virtual conference. And I hope it's the last one. I much prefer the, uh, the in, uh, you, know, you know, when we can see people face to face. Uh, the format, because this is virtual, is changed from previous, uh, from the normal uh, format we have. In, in, in this IRMC, we're really only going to have the technical papers, the presentations that will be given on today, tomorrow, and on Thursday. Uh, and the only other feature we're bringing over from the traditional IRMC is the, um, uh, what we call the breakout sessions, where people could submit questions to us ahead of time and uh, or during the actual breakout session itself and and then various people hopefully will contribute to answering those questions or discussing those those, those questions or comments that you might have and uh, as before the technical sessions are broken down into hydro generators which we're, what we're going to be covering today motors which is what we'll be covering um, uh, tomorrow and then on Thursday, we'll be doing turbo generators. So we cover the each, separate, each machine type of machine separately, but I think m many of you who've been to these conferences in the past know that there's actually a lot of interest if your primary interest is in motors. There's actually some useful papers that you'll find today in the hydro generator session. Uh, the breakout sessions are also organized in the same way. So we'll have a hydro session, and then a combined motor and turbo generator session. And again, I, I want to or encourage you to think of any questions you might have related to those kinds of machines and then uh, submit them to Karen, who's been the main uh, correspondent you, 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 you've been dealing with uh, for this conference so that we can have them to start those breakout sessions on the Wednesday and Thursday afternoon. Okay, this has actually turned out to be a fairly uh, big conference. Uh, as of the last numbers I saw a few days ago, there were about 132 people. So in some sense, it's our biggest conference since the one we first had back, I think it was 1997 in Dallas. Um, and uh, I need to point out that we will be recording this session uh, so that registrants who are in other time zones, we have people who are attending from around the world, um, and for some people it's essentially the middle of the night now, so uh, to make it a little bit easier for them, they'll be have access to the recorded session, so you need to be aware of that. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Joseph Bowie, uh, he's Vice President of uh, Qualitrol Services, and in fact, he has been doing the welcome speech for the IRMC, I think since 2004, Joseph, when you became President of IRIS. So with that, Joseph, take it away. Okay, good morning, good evening, uh, and uh, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. I hope you can hear me well and clear. Um, I'll just have a few slides. Uh, to talk to you briefly about uh, Iris and also the the company we're part of, which is Qualitrol, as well as the corporation, uh, Fortiv, which has been our parent for now 11 years. So just to start, Fortiv at a glance is about a $5.2 billion revenue company. Uh, about 40% of that revenue is generated through recurring revenue. As you can see, most of our income comes in from uh, the U.S., but we have a substantial presence in China as well and in Western Europe. And the rest of the world would include uh, the Middle East, Latin America and such. Now, the way we are, our businesses are positioned, the utilities and power generation uh, component of it is in around 10 to 15%, as you can see here on the pie chart. <clears throat> and that's mainly because we've been uh, doing various acquisitions over the last little while. Um, that's corporately. Uh, and also within Qualitrol and, and other businesses that are kind of adjacent to us, 
in our in our group we do have some utilities of power generation type of focus and uh and uh, again you know we we do include the fluke and tectronics as part of that as well um <clears throat> this is some of our group companies here and uh this is a slide obviously from our ceo when he's pitching it uh the Ford corporation to our investors and as you can see uh, Qualitrol is part of the Precision Technologies group, which is about 35% of total sales. And I'll take a deeper dive uh, into that in a second. And uh, operating margin is in the 20% range, and recurring revenue is about 20%. Re what recurring revenue means is basically software services and, and such. Uh, if you think of uh, business as a SaaS model or something of that nature. Uh, so Tektronics is uh, part of that, that group of company in, in precision technologies. You would recognize them. You might recognize Jans and, of course, et cetera as well, uh, depending on uh, uh, whether you are in, you know, working closer to distribution or, or you're more in the transmission side of, of things. So what about precision technology? That's about $1.8 uh, billion dollar part, uh, component of, of, of the whole portfolio. And I'm missing critical workflow is we develop products and solutions for customers, then we validate them in the field. And that's usually a long period of time. As you know, uh, you know, we work with many of you uh, on pilots and we work with many of you on doing studies either by ourselves together with the individual uh, utilities or in the individual uh, industrial company. Sometimes we're part of an EPRI uh, work, work group. Sometimes we're part of the CEA work group. So diff different methods and, 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 and different organ, you know, groups we join or sometimes we work on, on standards through IEEE or CGRE or IEC. So uh, once we do the validation, we, we go into full scale production and then we obviously spend a lot of time on services. And uh, services are important because you know, utilities are usually not in the center of any major city. So uh, you know, providing that support Globally is also a big component of, 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 of the whole offering. So a deeper dive into Qualitrol. Qualitrol was established in 1945 with headquarters in Fairport, New York. Um, mainly, if you're not familiar with Fairport, Fairport is really outside Rochester, suburb of Rochester. And it was part of Danaher Corporation actually since actually the 90s, or uh, that's, that's, that's uh, Qualitrol itself. And then it grew through acquisition. We have um, business we conduct in 93 countries. There's over 600 employees in, in, in this part of our business uh, and over 500 customers, mainly in the electrical field. So if you look at our product offerings, you will be familiar in this conference it's all about the motors and generators component of it, which is a uh, kind of power, power generation side of things. But we also do a considerable amount, I would say, 80% uh, of our revenue comes from uh, uh, other parts of, 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 of the grid, which is gas insulated substation. You know, we do breaker monitoring there. We do partial discharge on GIS. Uh, and then we do some, some uh, work on uh, fault monitoring, both in, in, in substations and, and, and in generating stations. But we do also line traveling waveform location of, of, of faults. Um, phaser measurement and the power quality measurements. And finally, you know, one of the big areas of, of, of Qualitrol, which was a traditional Qualitrol and represents probably, I would say about 40% of our revenue is everything to do with transformers, right? This is um, medium to high voltage transformers. And we, we have some very, very traditional type of gauges and sensors that uh, we've been manufacturing for 75 years. And then we have some more innovative uh, uh, condition-based maintenance type tools uh, for online monitoring of those assets, such as DGA, again, partial discharge. More recently, we, we launched a pushing monitoring solution. And all of that helps people assess the condition of those large transformers. And, and based on the story that I'm giving you, you can see that the theme is, is, is consistent. Uh, we, typically monitor or we, we develop technologies to, to monitor, assess the conditions of, of large assets. Typically we do that online. We do have some offline solutions for 
for for for uh, helping people, you know, do operation and maintenance uh, on those assets. Uh, but overall, what we're trying to do is basically partner with our utility and industrial customers to help them in their operation and maintenance and life management, life cycle management of their asset. So after all that, obviously we have a bunch of experts and those experts are running this conference today, Greg and Ladin, and, uh, Howard and uh, a bunch of other experts, but we have the same type of focus and team on the transmission and distribution side. And again, those people with, you know, long track record in the utility industry are supporting both our research and development efforts, they're support, uh, supporting our customer uh, customer service efforts, as well as working with customers post diagnosis or post analytics, if you want to call it, which is they're capable of supporting you with your major decisions and, and, and or at least put you in contact with people who can help you make those decisions on the, in, in, the, in the area of operation and maintenance. So finally, last slide, last, last slide on self-promotion here. Um, you know, Iris Power, again, uh, you know, it's been in business for over 30 years now, and uh, we have employees, uh, service, and, 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 and sales, uh, in, in, you know, teams in USA, China, Brazil, India, Korea, Middle East. And we were established in 1990, as I said, over 30 years of delivering, you know, support and services to this industry and being an active participant. We spent a lot of time in our effort, not only doing and, and, and working with you guys on some innovative tools and products, but we also uh, try to be good citizens and, and participate in as many IEEE, IEC, and other standards committees. And uh, that, that effort is, is not only with our experts, many of our commercial people are also uh, well engaged in those forums in order to understand better you know, what the needs are of our customers. And so in terms of uh, our track record here, you know, we're well known for our partial discharge uh, solution. Uh, we have been installing sensors on rotating machines almost every day through, through those 30 years. And by far we're the largest supplier of online partial discharge equipment for rotating machines. And, uh, you know, our claim to fame is also this database that we've been working on for the last two, two and a half decades. But although that this database extends to Ontario Hydro, we do have you know specifically targeted bunch of data that we started collecting specifically uh, ourselves uh, uh, since the mid '90s, and and so uh, and we've been publishing those papers. But again, the theme continues. You know, on our JS side of 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 of, of our portfolio, we have a similar uh, uh, tool and and uh, you know solution for our GIS customers. Again, you know, database and some machine learning tools to help them identify partial discharge and differentiate them uh, and differentiate that from noise and other, uh, you know, harmless uh, uh, activity uh, that, that, that may mask the problems that they're developing in, in that asset. So uh, again, the theme is consistent, you know, some sort of equipment, some sort of measurement device, some sort of a, a tool to help you uh, differentiate and, and and get to the to the to the symptoms of uh, as the problem develop, and and then train that over time, and then assess the component, you know, relative to each other or relative to a wider fleet of of, of similar components, uh, and uh, then make some decisions both to do subsequent inspection testing or you know to do to plan intervention. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, as Greg said, I've been doing this since 2004. It's been my distinct pleasure to do that. It is a little bit hard with doing this online and I've been spending countless hours online at this conference, well, not at this conference, and many conferences, similar conferences. And I, I'm sure everybody started with that and it would be nice to, 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 to be together and crack a beer and have a meal and have a coffee together at a conference and I'm so much looking forward to that. I think if I'm not mistaken, our next one is, is sl uh, slated for somewhere, uh, either New Orleans or I can't remember what-, what uh, I think we're start. back where we're, we're supposed to originally have been in Las Vegas, both oh, last year okay. and, and this year. Well, there year. you go. That's, that's, that's really hot. I'm sure it's, it's, it's scorching out there today. Yes. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's always important, you know. This this conference is known for making 
people connect with each other and you know sometimes those sparks create new opportunities for either working collaboration and studying new problems that are developing in the industry or sometimes people you know have had enough experience efficient experience where they're out there advocating on on recommending those new tools and techniques either from iris or from other companies that that, that provide similar solutions uh, in order to help them optimize uh, the the performance of their uh, assets and solutions so thank you very much for attending again it's it's probably the largest conference in terms of attendees and uh, I uh, would like to welcome you next year in person to, to the conference. So please enjoy the program. And most importantly, ask questions. This is all about getting all those experts and all those colleagues of ours together for a short period of time and making those connections. Have a good conference. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Um, Okay, so today's session is on primarily on hydro generators, but I think hopefully many of you will find uh, 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 the subject uh, interesting, even if you're you're primarily into motors or turbo generators. Just a few words on how we're going to do things here. Uh, the presentations will be live, okay, and Osrin will you're up next. Um, so, uh, but the present pre presentation should be 20 minutes or, or less. And uh, during that period, if you have questions and stuff, please use the question box, not the chat box, the question box. And because of the, the large number of people attending, it's not gonna be really feasible to open microphones for people other than the, the, the speakers uh, today. So I want you to put your questions in the question box after the presentation. Then we'll spend 10 minutes or whatever seems appropriate for uh, uh, the, the presenter to answer those questions uh, or discuss those questions that are gonna come up. And before we do that, because this is a hydro session, this is, I'm gonna give a little bit of a plug. Uh, there's a book, I hope you can see it okay, uh, that was just published this year uh, by Wiley called Handbook of Large Hydro, Generator, Large Hydro Generators, uh, their operation and their maintenance. Uh, the principal authors are uh, Stefano Bomben and Glenn Mottershead, who are well-known experts in the hydro generator business. And uh, it's published by Wiley. You can get it from Amazon or any of those normal places. Uh, but if you haven't got that book and you are involved with hydro generators, I, 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 I suggest you take a look at it. Okay, so the first presentation is going to be by Osrin Husniak. And Osrin um, works for Vesky in, in Croatia, in, in Europe, so it's late in the day for him now. Uh, he's had more than 10 years experience in vibration data collection, processing and, anal and analysis. Uh, Osrin's uh, technical background is, is uh, his degrees in, in physics from uh, Faculty of Science. Uh, since, he, since 2006, he's worked for Vesky in Zagreb, uh, providing expertise in signal analysis and software development. So now, Osrin, hopefully you can share your screen. Okay, do you see where that button is? Or can somebody sure, show, I, show his screen? I'm trying to share now, I hope you can see it. I think something okay. is coming up. Okay, that's, that's good. Let me just put on up the presentation. Right. Okay, so. Okay, and go into presentation okay. mode. Sure, sure. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. Yes, perfectly. Oh, that's good. Okay, thank you very much. And I wanna thank, uh, uh, first of all, I wanna thank the, organizing, the organizer for giving me and my company the opportunity to, uh, to attend. I was uh, in a couple of, uh, uh, at least uh, it was at, I think one, uh, I was at one uh, RMC live and it, I agree with Greg and Joseph, it's much better to be live <laughs> now I'm, alone in the room since actually here it is also holiday Croatia has a holiday today <laughs> but but still uh, I mean it, it's definitely better alive so thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we do and today's topic will be uh, one power plant that's about roughly 60 years old and the units are also roughly 60 years old and we'll be talk, talking about the magnetic un unbalance problem and how we tackled it uh, uh, using various diagnostics, uh, primarily vibration, but not necessarily only vibration, 
There were also other sensors such as air gap, magnetic flux sensor, etc., uh, used to try and pinpoint the root cause of the problem and obviously to solve it uh, as practically and uh, as possible uh, for the unit to be running stable uh, for a long period of time. <clears throat> so this is the on the right side. Let me just put this guy here. The right side, you can see the the main uh, power, the power plant building. It basically contains of two units. Actually, there is a third, like a small unit of one megawatt here, just just for, uh, uh, but it's not important here. We will be focusing on on these on these two guys here. As I said, it was commissioned sometime in 1957, and uh, both units are approximately uh, 30 megawatt, and they are Francis units. They're both three-phase synchronous uh, uh, generating units, and about 10.5 uh, at, at 10.5 kilovolts. And here is the 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 power output of the of of the units. Each unit has uh, 20 poles, so it means it's running on the 300 RPM to be able to produce 50 Hertz uh, 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 voltage and current to the grid. Obviously, it's an European, you know, those are U European units and they are very near the Croatia where I'm, where I'm from. <clears throat> the, about the design of the units, uh, from the point of view of the trust bearing, it is a suspended type unit. I will show you uh, 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 schematics diagram later and to kind of though there were some differences between the two units uh, the most of the issues found were similar for both and uh, that's why I will be kind of switching between one and the second uh, to, to try and illustrate uh, so I will be showing data from one and uh, uh, first and the second to try and illustrate my points one funny picture photo I, I've took from, from the power plant and with the silly question is hydro energy clean I mean I, I found this image interesting because from one of these sides there comes dirty water and one of these sides comes the clean water and what do you think uh, uh, the water is from the from the power plant is it's actually the one to the left so this is the river it pick up picks up mud and this is the the, this is the clean water coming from the bar. It's just a, just a small joke, but very fast it becomes dirty. So it down 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 the river. As I said, both units had similar issues, and uh, on unit one uh, we noticed, or better, the power plant personnel noticed the increased vibrations after operation at runaway speed. Uh, the things we uh, measured first were extremely large vibrations. I have not seen. I have seen one unit with more vibrations than this one. I will show you the, the diagram later. So there were extreme vibrations going on. And after we passed on all uh, regimes that were available, so mechanical, uh, uh, electromagnetical, and thermal unbalances were detected. Also, there was a, a large runout present which could not have been solved up to one point in time because they did not have the high pressure all to, to solve the problem, but later they installed it on our, on our suggestions and it was fixed. But definitely this unit had a lot of problems and not only uh, these ambulances were detected and present, uh, there were some additional issues such as uh, two of those, the, the most important ones are listed here. So we had a missile and rotor and bearing axis. We also had a loose connection or should I say bond between truss collar and shaft and I will be showing you how exactly we uh, able we were able to diagnose these using vibration uh, uh, diagnostic tools. Typical measurement uh, layout uh, is shown here so it is actually uh, uh, we found it most useful to use a uh, high channel uh, high in this sense means like 18 channel portable instrument uh, with, to which we could connect uh, uh, various uh, uh, types of sensors. Usually those included uh, proximity probes, I'm sure you're familiar with, and, and the accelerometers. So basically the proximity probe, since it is a free bearing unit, and as I said, the upper guide bearing is of, of combined type. It is also a thrust uh, uh, bearing. We, we use the basically four sensors per plane. So these guys are, are your proximity probes. They're mounted somewhere on the bearing and pointing to the shaft. 
and then you can see the relative shaft movement relative to the bearing, of course, and ob obviously also have the absolute vibration sensors, the accelerometers or velocity meters or similar sensors, and you connect them uh, usually via magnetic magnetic connection to the to the bearing. So basically, you have four sensors per measurement plan, but we did change the locations of the sensors for different types of measurement. But usually, if you can pick it all up uh, uh, at once, you you should use some kind of a more channel account, so not use those one or two channel uh, 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 instruments, that's not enough. So you have to pick up all of the data from from uh, from all of the measurements planned at once, if possible. Here's a couple of pictures from the from the power plant. What you can see, see here are the basically summer in the upper guide bearing region above. So this is the thrust color and you can see the the uh, proximity probes on uh, uh, on their uh, mounting uh, positions uh, uh, facing the the, the thrust collar somewhere below below the uh, the slip rings. You do not see on these pictures the accelerometers, uh, nor do you see them here. This is basically somewhere below the lower guide bearing, so the proximity probes at 90 degrees. So you can track uh, what the shaft is uh, doing within the bearing itself. So you can plot your orbits and conclude, make your conclusions from, from this, this data. Here you see, I think you, you can see, so here is the proximity probe. So this is the turbine level. So you can see the proximity probes and you can also see the accelerometers here. And so it's just a couple of pictures to, to get the idea of how it looked. What we found out to be most uh, valuable and most uh, most important to uh, to track uh, uh, to find is how to perform calculations. Of obviously, when you pick up data inside your uh, uh, inside your instrument and then transfer it uh, live data, so that means waveform data, raw waveform data, raw digitized data from the sensors. What it made uh, uh, sense and what is usually uh, one of the most important steps is to try immediately to calculate uh, 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 any uh, values of interest. We call them descriptors, which is basically calculated values from the from the raw signal here for illustrational purposes. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you are trying to pick up from, so, so the, the, the brown signal is actually something that is measured, for example, on a reciprocating engine or something like that. And uh, uh, what you uh, are then trying to do uh, one of the things that you do is trying to calculate uh, how many, what is the percentage or what is the amplitude of the first harmonic present in that signal. So you kind of decompose the signal into its components. And then you have, you're tracking these heights of these guys. So the first harmonic, the second harmonic, and not only the amplitudes, this is uh, important to track also the phases relative to the, to the, to the, to the trigger. The trigger is the sensor, which is basically giving you uh, once per shaft uh, revolution and impulse, and then you're able to track phases relative to that uh, signal. And this is also important to uh, to see how that vibrational uh, vector is actually changing when going from one regime to the other. Here's a list uh, uh, of also some of the uh, other things that you can calculate, uh, such as the peak, peak to peak value, which is becoming uh, more and more important, I would say, but due to the fact that uh, in 2018, a new standard was uh, published which kind of prefers the peak to peak value and kind of makes the old S max value. I'm, I'm sure you heard about if you're in this vibration business uh, uh, that you heard about. It's basically li like the largest vibrations per plane. So these, these two guys are actually signals from one plane of measurement, the relative uh, vibration signals. And uh, if you plot them, the, you get the orbit and then you say, okay, what is the worst worst vibration in my measurement plan? And you get the S-max. It's kind of becoming obsolete, but anyway, it has its uses uh, as well. So you have to have good calculations. The second uh, type of sensor, which is big, big, which turned out to be very uh, interesting and important is also the air gap sensor. I'll show you the picture. Basically, it is a sensor which is glued to your starter core, and then it kind of checks how your poles, as your poles are passing by, you can see the signals such as this. So the black line is the, the trigger. So once per revolution impulse, and then you get this uh, purple line, which is basically your waveform. If, by knowing which pole comes after the, the black one, the, the trigger, then you are able to do plots like these. 
this is basically your pol your plot of the of the uh, pole profile with uh, 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 so these numbers on the x axis are actually pole numbers, and you get the plot like that, and then you're able to do your calculations such as what is the maximum value uh, of some pole has, and what is the pole number, or what is the minimum value some pole has, and what is its number, or what is the average value of all of the poles, and by using those numbers, for example, not only that you can also calculate what is the first harmonic between within the air gap, not only uh, as you would calculate it between the bearing planes, you can do it also for the air gap singles. So you can calculate the first harmonic amplitude phase, the second harmonic, etc. And from these descriptors, these numbers, you basically can get a good idea of what kind of problem you might be experiencing. For example, on the lower graph here, you can see something happens twice per revolution, something. So this is basically showing you an oval rotor. So this is how you can track that from the DC value, seeing it in, 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 if you have multiple sensors, you can see how the stutter is might be expanding, et cetera. So basically all the numbers are good numbers to, 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 uh, to trend immediately when being on site. <clears throat> One also important number is the difference between air gaps in the adjacent poles, such as the edge diff here, because it can show you if, one pole might be protruding more than the others. So this is also good. It's also good to track this number. So to get into the, to the data, these were the data from 2012. We actually have shown this uh, at some hydrovision conference, this graph in particular, but it, this unit has a lot of history. I'll be showing new graphs for you here today. And as you can see, there were extreme vibrations. So this, is a 750 microns. And per, per measurement plane, you can see that the black line is showing you the, uh, the upper guide bearing plane, X and Y directions. The red one is showing you lower guide bearing, X, Y, and the green one is the turbine guide bearing. These are some of the limits the, from the old standard, the ISO 7919-5, and these are new, some limits from the new standard. And you can see immediately it's very high. What this standard, the new standard also talks about is that you always have to measure the uh, relative, that is the proximity probe and the absolute, that is the accelerometers on your bearing together. So you have to measure them uh, in parallel, which makes sense because when you look at it, these graphs and I have not mentioned on the upper graph, it is the relative vibrations on the lower graph, it is the absolute vibrations. So this is the proximity probe, this is the accelerometers. Also large numbers for some planes are shown. And by looking only at this, you would say, okay, the black line is very low, it's good, right? But then you check your absolute vibrations and you see these accelerometers showing you pretty high numbers, which actually means, and this was one of the diagnostics tool that helped us diagnose that uh, there was uh, there were mis misalignment between the bearing uh, center and the shaft center. So shaft was actually pushing a bit against one side and all of the vibrations that so the relative vibrations were small because it was already leaning against the side of the bearing, but those vibrations came out. So which is why this is kind of a diagnostics you can do and, uh, and we did to uh, nail the uh, misaligned uh, bearing and, uh, and, uh, and the shaft, misaligned bearing and the shaft uh, lines. Another thing we can, uh, we can see here is for a very large, uh, relative vibrations on the lower guide bearing, which are extreme, you can see relatively mild, not so large vibrations on the on the on the uh, absolute vibrations. And why is that? Well, basically, we concluded from this and from the uh, ratio between those that there is probably that the lower guide bearing is already has already failed in the sense that those uh, pads supporting the 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 segments are uh, uh, are damaged and these large vibrations were allowed to go this high because there was basically no radial uh, no radial bearing to hold to hold to give it stiffness to to hold it in place also the turbine guide bearing is just doing what the upper the lower guide bearing is it's just following it So what we did prior to the uh, prior to the uh, overhaul, and it, def it was definitely time for the overhaul. The unit had to stop. Uh, we, what we did prior to the overhaul, we tried to establish the so-called dynamical uh, rotor line. 
which is nothing more than a rotor operation uh, operating deflection shape on the first on the first harmonic. And I did not mention that, uh, but the first harmonic, so basically this line here was dominant. And this line here, the first harmonic is related to runouts, your mechanical, your electrical unbalance, uh, and also as you see your, your, your thermal unbalance issues. What can be seen here? I see here's a couple of pictures of the sensors. So we, besides those three planes I talked to you about, so uh, this, this it was the first the upper guy bearing plane. This was the, the second bearing plane. This was the third bearing plane. We added two more. So one on the on, uh, one just below the truss collar. This photo is showing you this, and the, the other on the coupling. And what we're able to see is this dynamical rotor line, which basically, as I said, is, is the operating a deflection shape on the first harmonic. And what you would expect if the connection basically between the truss collar and your shaft was firmed and the connection and the bond was solid, you would expect this line to go something like that, to just be straight up, but it wasn't. And this actually means that there is some kind of relative uh, movement of the shaft in this region, relative movement of the shaft uh, compared, uh, uh, compared to the truss collar. And our conclusion was that there is no solid connection between truss collar and shaft, that the shear fit is lost. This was prior to overhaul. We didn't know what the guys doing the overhaul were gonna find. An additional proof of that was that there's actually out of phase uh, 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 vibration when, when coming from here to here. And it did prove to be true. Uh, the guys doing the overhaul when they were uh, removing those up uh, a wedge to remove the truss collar. Usually you need to heat the truss collar for it to, because it's a shrink fit type. So, so you're either using blow, blow torches or, or induction heating, you have to heat it up and it, it shouldn't go down. But in this case, it was practically easily removed immediately. And this had to be dealt with, with, uh, with, uh, within, within the overhaul. <clears throat> Osrin, yeah. we're, we're moving along here. Okay. Okay. Okay, I have to. Limits on. Okay, I, I will be quick now. Uh, this is a vibration caused uh, damage to the in the lower guide bearing. Uh, this was proven, which uh, from those 700 micros were actually proven during the overhaul to be true. A couple of pictures of a guy se setting up clearance uh, uh, for the upper guide bearing during the overhaul. Additional couple of pictures uh, showing you photos uh, of lo lot of rolling and uh, uh, obviously. Uh, when we put together the machine together, uh, you had to perform balancing. This is the balancing weights uh, uh, being put on the on the on the on the uh, on the on the rotor. <clears throat> and after the overhaul and prior to the balancing, this was the situation. So a lot of run out here. Then uh, mechanical rotation the vibrations were like, like here. And when you, they turned on the excitation, as you, see, you can see, the vibration started increasing. But also when the, the heat was, the temp, when the temperature was increasing because the load was put on the unit, and so the stator became, became uh, uh, increasing the temperature, you can see that the vibrations are also increasing. This is the vibration on the first harmonic, as I said, it is the, the most dominant one. We decided that the good criteria for all of the regimes to be covered adequately was not to exceed 100 microns and the bearing, when I say 100 micron, I mean peak side, that's what I mean, peak, not peak value, this is peak value. And the bearing clearance was 230 microns uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on my side, so this was very satisfactory, and the vibrations were below 0.5 millimeters per second. And at that time, we concluded, okay, it's a victory, we are, uh, that's good, good enough, because a permanently stable uh, state was uh, uh, achieved, but we would have been happier to minimize the electromagnetic imbalance, which uh, should have been done uh, uh, at that point, but there were actually no high pressure oil so that they couldn't leave the unit, so they couldn't fix how uh, uh, out of shape the rotor might be, how out of circle the rotor might be. And that's what they did uh, uh, during this, the overhaul five years later. Here you can see the rotor pause. We glued two additional sensors, which proved to be helpful to establish how actually out of circle of the rotor is because if you have changes with uh, uh, magnetic uh, uh, so with excitation if you have vibrational changes that can either be related to the rotor shape which is the air gap 
or the uh, uh, some shorts in the rotor, which is shown you here by the flux sensor. So the flux sensor, the direct sensor, is installed, and this is the uh, the graphs that we uh, uh, obtained during the mechanical test at very low RPM. So if we knew the exact polymer and we knew them, how uh, we knew that this is pole 16, 15, etc. We concluded, okay, what we must do now is just push all of these poles from two. To 11 down. This is actually data from unit two, which had more pronounced magnetic uh, ambulance problem. We just have to push them here on this, and it will pretty much equalize all of the air gaps, and this should reduce the uh, electromagnetic ma magnetic ambulance down to down to smaller numbers. This is just some other graphs showing you uh, that actually when the excitation is on, and in this case, it's all all the unit is on load. This is also showing you uh, how the uh, flux versus the air gap is looking, and it makes sense because the larger the air gap, uh, the lower the flux. So it's just an additional uh, picture to support support everything. <clears throat> now that would easier said than done because just equalizing the air gap is easy to say, but this is the actual picture from the power plant. This is the dovetail connection, and this is a like six years old unit. What you can do is have to first very it's very hard to remove all those all those wedges and also if you push the pole near to the stator you have to use some kind of other shimming to 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 so the, the guys doing the overhaul they didn't want to bother not bother but it was what if something fails what if something breaks then they wanted to uh, uh, have a, a different kind of suggestion this was suggestion one we thought was better. But at the end, they agreed on the su suggestion too. So how do you do that if, it's, if the pole re-wedging is not possible? Avoid the regimes with extreme vibrations. If the unit is balanced, such as to minimize the vibration after the excitation is on, and avoid all me running in mechanical, uh, in mechanical operation, uh, then you should be fine. If you can turn on the excitation automatically above 85% of normal speed, regardless of the operating regime, you should be good to go and these conditions were uh, can be maintained only of obviously if some failure uh, such as stutter short circuits uh, are are seen then you obviously cannot uh, keep the excitation uh, on just to prove this i've put together two more slides and then i'm and, and i'm done these slides show you uh, uh, differences between the vibrations uh, when the unit is stopped uh, when, with the excitation on so i call this stop one and when the unit is uh, stopped uh, by uh, uh, turning off the excitation i call this stop two so this is the rotational speed and on the lower graph you have the same uh, uh, relative vibrations uh, the same colors as before you can see immediately when you do, do the stop one the vibrations have increased some let's say around 190 micros, let's say something like that. They even decrease on the lower guide bearing. But on stop two, and this is was the, sorry, I did not mention, this was a load rejection from 20 megawatt. This is the, but in one case, the excitation was on and the other case, it was not. Up to 195 microns, then you would have uh, this kind of, uh, uh, for the excitation of, you would, the vibrations would increase up to 195 microns. And similar graphs for the 30 megawatt vibrations on, on one hand did not increase above 125 microns, and on the other case, up to 230 microns. So sorry for if I used a little bit more time than I should have. But uh, yeah, I hope uh, so. We couldn't do at the end what we wanted by rewedging the poles, but we could keep the unit uh, running stable by uh, by suggesting and uh, to just keep the excitation on uh, whenever possible. And thank you for- Okay, thank you very much, Osrin. Um, are there questions from the floor? I'm not seeing um, questions relevant to this particular presentation yet. Um, anything coming okay. up? I don't yes. see questions as well. So there is nothing coming from audience. Okay. Okay. Well, um, well, maybe while they're thinking of something, uh, Oz, you know, I have a, I have a question. The, um, uh, you, I think I can't remember the slide. I think it was slide twelve or something. Uh, you were talking about that the vibration changes as the uh, temperature 
increases. Uh, why does that occur? Well, uh, yeah, in this region here, it is uh, so the unit was synchronized and put on grid. Now uh, the stator is uh, you know heating up, and if for one one particular reason that can be caused to this, uh, we did not investigate that further. We were satisfied with being able to balance the units such as the vibrations were not too high in all of the regimes. But basically, if you have, uh, for example, stator, I don't know, expanding non non uniformly in uh, all of the directions, then mm. since it the the cross uh, how does the the, the bearing uh, star how how do you say uh, the the bearing uh, uh, the bearing holder is leaning against the stator, it can ah. you know move in one direction. Uh, so basically, if it moves in one direction, it can even I've seen it on one additional uh, plant where it can you know mess up your runout line. So it can basically so the whole uh, the whole uh, bearing is actually uh, moving and you know shifting shifting uh, uh, basically the shaft and this causes the this can be one of the reasons why the why the why the vibrations are changing thermally. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. I, uh... Okay. In that okay. case, uh, thank you, Ozan, for presenting. Next. Uh, I see there's a question just popped up, uh, uh, Mladen. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, can read it. Uh, do you and how do you align phase accessories and eddy probe sensors? Phase, I know, phase accelerometers and eddy probe sensors. So the question is on alignment of the accelerometers and eddy probe sensors. Well, uh, uh, first of all, you you would uh, align them in one particular line uh, in the sense uh, that the, behind each of those guys, each proximity probe, there would be somewhere on the bearing the accelerometer. And if the question was how do you align them regarding to the power plant uh, water intake, usually you would do it somewhere like that. So, so if, if this was water intake, you have one here and other 90 degrees uh in the rotational direction it's not necessary it's more important that they are at 90 degrees but this then correlates that uh, beginning of the orbit which is something when you look at the orbit you want to be able to immediately see the phase relationship between the planes but basically in one line is the relative uh, the absolute behind the relative and at 90 degrees and usually in the direction of water and 90 degrees to that in the rotational direction that's the usual if i understood the question correctly yeah, I think you did address it, so I don't see any. Uh, uh, there is a another question which I think we can try to address now, or if not, we can leave it for later. Uh, it is about integration of accelerometer signals, so I think this is a requiring a little bit longer answer, and unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we will address this question uh, follow up. Okay. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, done, it's done in specific in the laptop, so it's basically you get the raw signal from the accelerometer, you integrate within the software. So, okay, mm -hmm. so you may be even answering this one. <laughs> uh, we just you have to be careful to high pass the signal, so not to have lower frequency bothering your giving a false, false, uh, uh, false data or wrong data. I would say so. 